My name is Amber Raimondo. I'm the Energy Director at the Grand Canyon Trust, which is a nonprofit conservation advocacy organization dedicated to supporting the rights of Native peoples on the Colorado Plateau. I'm based in Flagstaff, Arizona, and I'll be moderating today's webinar. The threat of climate change is an existential one. Science tells us that if the global community is to avoid the worst effects of climate change, then by 2030, we have to reduce carbon emissions globally by 45% from 2010 levels and reach net zero emissions by the year 2050. Yet, according to the United Nations Environmental Program, UNEP, mining accounts for 10% of energy-related climate pollution. And according to the EPA, mining is the nation's largest toxic polluter. The mining industry has also spent the last decade constructing a false scarcity narrative to convince policymakers and the best climate that the best climate solution is to escalate mining on public land. This rhetoric sometimes involves that invokes nationalism and it exploits structural inequities still lingering in current public lands mining law and rules. We explicitly reject this gambit while arguing for more mining industry oversight to better protect climate, communities, water, and wildlife resources. Besides, there are better places to, to source materials than mines. Recycling at carefully planned, purpose-built facilities, reuse and substitution, among other methods, provide a cleaner way to source materials. These more responsible sourcing alternatives will help reduce mining demands thereby avoiding some of the climate, human, and other resource impacts. New research concludes, with the right policies, we can create a circular economy that may approximate half the world's demand for lithium, cobalt, nickel, and other minerals key to the, the clean energy transition. As the market for secondary use of materials for, from electric car batteries matures, this further reduces the pressure to source from mines. Major consumers, including automakers and electronics companies, have also started to direct suppliers um, to, to source more responsibly. An entire circular economy infrastructure surrounding the reuse and recycling of minerals has sprouted and now thrives within the European Union. Powered by a new European Commission battery directive, those governments are opening opportunities to strengthen commercial viability of battery material recycling and reuse. As with any transition, it's critical that we ensure against unintended consequences, especially the structural inequities codified in public lands, mining law, and rules. This means fixes Butler Colonial Era 1970 or 1872 mining law and its regulations. America's 19th century minerals rush led a cascade of blasting human rights and environmental impacts. That law still governs public lands mining today. The just, equitable, and fair 21st century renewable energy transition demands meaningful reform of this unjust 19th century mining law and its 20th century rules. The Biden-Harris administration has made it clear that both climate action and environmental justice are a priority. And as the country works toward meeting these challenges, it is incumbent upon all of us to ensure that solving one problem does not perpetuate disproportionate impacts upon impoverished communities, indigenous communities, and other communities of color. We must also turn our attention away from primarily sourcing materials from new mining. For this transition to succeed, we must instead construct a narrative favoring a circular economy with more responsibly sourced materials. Today's discussion, we hope we'll focus on and share ideas that help spark the kind of mindset in all of us that we need to move forward. With that, I'd like to introduce you all to today's panelists. After I've introduced all three of them, each person will be given five minutes to present and following their presentations, we'll move to a moderated discussion. At the end of today's webinar, we'll have about 15 minutes for the audience to ask questions of the panelists. So please, if you have questions as folks are presenting, please feel free to type those questions into the chat and Raquel will be tracking those and we'll get, we'll get to those in the latter part of our time together. So our first panelist is going to be Michael Lopez. He's a senior staff attorney with the Nez Perce Tribes Office of Legal Counsel. He provides advice on matters regarding treaty rights, natural resources and the environment, water, contracting and land use. Our next panelist is going to be Justin Mulvaney. He's a professor in the Environmental Studies Department at San Jose State University and a fellow with the Payne Institute for Public Policy at the Colorado School of Mines. Justin's research includes work on just transitions, solar energy, commodity chains, and clean energy development. And our final panelist today is gonna to be Lauren Pagel. She's an expert on mining, oil and gas policy, having worked to protect communities, the environment, and our climate from the adverse impacts of extraction for 20 years. Lauren has led Earthworks policy teams of the past decade, represented Earthworks on the steering committee for the Western Mining Action Network, and currently serves as the co-chair for the Methane Partners Program. Mr. Lopez, whenever you're ready, you should be free to present. Thank you very much. 
Uh, on behalf of the Nez Perce Tribal Executive Committee, the governing body of the Nez Perce Tribe, or Nimipu, I'd like to thank the organizers for the opportunity to participate on this panel today. I'll be speaking briefly to the topic of reasonably sourced materials and protecting tribal interests, treaty reserve rights, and the environment. Next slide, please. To have this conversation, we must acknowledge mining's profound effect on Native nations. Even before the 1872 mining law, non-Indian mining caused devastating injury to indigenous rights, sacred places, health, and culture. Gold rushes starting in the mid 19th century resulted in throngs of miners flooding tribal lands in violation of sacred treaties, resulting in deadly conflict and further loss of tribal lands. And those threats are not some vestige of a bygone era. They continue today. Pebble Mine, Rosemont, Conglomerate Mesa, and the proposed Stibnite Mine, which I'll discuss shortly, are a, just a few examples of those ongoing struggles by Native nations to protect their lands, rights, and resources. And according to a 2017 University of New Mexico study, there are 160,000 abandoned or legacy hard rock mines in the West, many of which are contaminating approximately 40% of Western watersheds and 600,000 tribal citizens live within six miles of abandoned mines, resulting in chronic and disproportionate exposure to metals and other dangerous pollutants. This exposure exacerbates indigenous communities' ongoing challenges with community health, poverty, and access to education. Next slide, please. I'm now gonna focus on the Nez Perce tribe or Nimipu. The U.S. executed more than 370 treaties with Native nations between 1778 and 1871 when it ended treaty making formally. Among those treaties is the Treaty, Nez Perce Treaty of 1855, in which the Nez Perce ceded millions of acres of land in what is today Idaho, Oregon, and Washington in exchange for an exclusive homeland and reserved fishing, hunting, gathering, and pasturing rights throughout the Nez Perce tribe's Aboriginal territory. Tribal members ex exercise these treaty reserved rights today, including on what are now federal public lands for subsistence, cultural, spiritual, and economic purposes. Next slide, please. Within the Nez Perce tribe uh, land seated in the Treaty of 1855 is the proposed Stibnite gold mine. Located in central Idaho at the headwaters of the East Fork, South Fork Salmon River on the Payette and Boise National Forests, this historically mined area has resulted in blocked fist passage, impaired water quality, and other impacts. The proposal is to take place uh, uh, one of the largest gold mines in the country for the coming decades with three open mining pits, hundreds of millions of tons of additional mine waste and tailings and increasing the footprint with significant new disturbance on public land. While the proposal is primarily for gold, the proponent, proponent claims the project is strategically important due to the gold mining byproduct antimony that may also be mined in the area. Next slide, please. <clears throat> the Nez Perce tribe's interests in the area are straightforward. This is Nez Perce country. The tribe has deep connections to this land since time immemorial. This watershed was home to one of the largest Chinook salmon runs in the entire Columbia River Basin. The tribe has treaty reserved rights in the area and has implemented millions of dollars in fish and habitat restoration there. Next slide, please. So in 2017, uh, the Nez Perce Tribal Executive Committee issued a resolution opposing the proposed Stibnite mine. Why? The tribe is deeply concerned the mine will block treaty reserved access, destroy treaty reserved and cultural resources and habitat, and further impair or alter the headwaters of the East Fork, South Fork Salmon River. These are not speculative claims. This is information that's contained in the draft environmental impact statement that the Forest Service itself issued in 2000, last year in August um, on the proposed mine. Next slide, please. Given the mining, uh, mining history's <clears throat> uh, impacts on Native nations, including on the Nimipu, uh, we view responsibly sourced minerals as including the following. 
acknowledgement of mining's past and ongoing environmental, cultural, and political injustices to indigenous people, honoring of treaty rights as the supreme law of land in the US constitution, mining doesn't trump treaties, protection of tribal access to, tradi to traditional lands, enactment and enforcement of stronger environmental regulations to protect tribal resources, and finally, strict controls on strategic mineral exploration, <clears throat> not a pretext for weakened regulations or government or public support for non-strategic mining. Next slide, please. That concludes uh, my very fast presentation. If you wanna learn more information about the proposed Stibnite mine from the Nez Perce Tribes perspective, please access digforthetruth.org, the, web the website in front of you. Thanks again for the opportunity to speak today. Thank you, Mr. Lopez. And Professor Mulvaney, we'll have you go next. So go ahead whenever you're ready. Okay, th thank you very much. And um, just wanna acknowledge that I'm, I'm zooming in from Papaluchum, which is unceded territory of the Awaswas speaking Aptos tribe, which is near uh, Monterey Bay, California. Um, what I'm gonna do is just talk about some of the metals that we're talking about digging out of the ground for this clean energy transition that we're anticipating and already experiencing. Next slide. So the emphasis for much of today's talk is gonna be focused on batteries, which um, lithium ion batteries, um, given the lightness of that element um, and you know, the advances in that technology are obviously leading to electrification of vehicles. We're seeing this, obviously we have information technology with lots of these batteries. And with the growth in electric vehicles and grid scale battery storage, we're gonna see big ramp ups in demand for these metals. And people have acknowledged this for more, even many decades, but you know, at least a decade. Um, and I think it's, next slide, important to note that, you know, that while there's a lot of emphasis on lithium and cobalt to some extent, there are lots of metals that will increase in demand because of these batteries. And the different lithium ion batteries have different battery chemistries. And we don't really know which one's gonna win in the end, which one's gonna be the one that's going to demand most of the metals. So you already, we're already seeing many companies eschewing or staying away from the cobalt. So maybe cobalt won't be in demand as much as we're anticipating right now. But for sure, in the short term, we're going to need more of that metal. Um, manganese is another one that we, we see. Um, nickel, um, obviously, is a, another big one. But they're not all in all the different battery chemistries. In fact, one of the more common ones that we're seeing deployed today is lithium iron phosphate, which you know, has some relatively common metals in it. But interestingly enough, because everybody's eschewing the other metals, we saw a big price spike in that battery technology just this recent fall. Next slide. So most and many of the metals that are uh, important for clean technologies are pretty rare or scarce in the Earth's crust. You know, acknowledging the, the false narrative of scarcity that was uh, described in the opening of this, um, you know, there are quite a few metals in both solar panels and, and in batteries that are, that are really uncommon or, or not as common um, as uh, the underlying metals of the current economy. So here I'm thinking, um, you know, in solar panels, for example, there's a metal called tellurium used in one type of thin film technology, one company uses 40% of the global supply of that element, which is pretty impressive, meaning there's not many, we're gonna to have to get more of that element if we wanna see more growth in that sector. And that might be coming from tailings, but it also might be coming from new mines. Tellurium is often found with gold. So that might be something that comes out of gold. It's often found with copper. Next slide. Um, and we know, you know, based on reports over the last decade that many of these metals are being taken uh, in places where we already are seeing disproportionate impacts. And a lot of this is artisanal mining, which is um, you know, a complicated topic because it's really important for livelihoods in these regions. But where you see these headlines uh, reoccurring about a resource curse, which is typically when a part, some community or a part a region is overly dependent on some chemical, and there's obviously uh, 
uh, that's one framing of that issue. There's that's a complicated topic as well. Resource curse. Next slide. Um, silver, for example, is another metal that is increasing in demand for clean technology. The, the solar industry uses, depends on how you measure it, somewhere on the order of 10%, 12% of the global silver supply. Now, each solar panel per watt output is being is using less silver. Trend, we're seeing less silver per solar panel. But in the last year or so, we're starting to see these bifacial solar panels that have cells on both sides, which will in the short term double the amount of silver required per solar panel, because now you got cells on both sides of the solar panel. So um, really important impact. I don't have a slide here on gold, but gold is in all the inverters that's in bat that goes from the, that connects the batteries and solar systems to the electrical system, the grid or a home. Next slide. Lithium, of course, you uh, probably have heard of the issues in, in South America. Um, we have, you can go to the next slide, the, we have issues already appearing here in the United States. So these are domestic issues. Um, there are 13,000. This is, this is information I got from Basin and Range Watch several years ago. Uh, 13,000 active plaster claims in Nevada alone in these areas, um, which have a lot of sagebrush, a lot of uh, important habitat, a lot of cultural resources. And I'll just make one other point here, which is that the, the development of of these extractives for batteries, we need to start thinking about batteries and solar panels as coupled systems because solar panels are not just gonna keep going out there because they're gonna need this energy storage with them. And increasingly we see solar farms being cited with energy storage systems. So we need to start thinking of these things as parts of the same, um, same rollout to, to some extent. Um, and I'll just make one other side note on the water side. So we're talking about mining for metals. There's a lot of water, groundwater wells being dropped in the ground around these solar farms as well. So there's a little bit of groundwater mining. There's energy storage projects, pumped energy storage that we be relying on groundwater that are being proposed as well. And of course, um, these lithium mine act, uh, mining projects would also have impacts to water and groundwater, surface water and things like that. Next slide. Um, copper, tellurium and gallium are metals that are in the solar industry, I think a, a lot of folks are focused on these unique or rare metals that are in clean technology, but copper is really, really going to be a big one, increased demand for electrification. So we see already forecasts of a shortfall in copper, which is one of the reasons we're starting to see more mines being proposed, because when prices go up, that's when all the investments start saying we should build more mines. Next slide. So that's just the copper demand. Next slide. Um, and aluminum is another metal that we, is a more common metal that we'll probably see more of. It's in batteries, it's in um, the light weighting of vehicles. So we're seeing it with electric vehicles, it's not just in the batteries, but it's actually in the, the frame. Um, so that's another metal that we know that has all sorts of impacts to communities, particularly with groundwater. Again, most mining usually has heavy metal groundwater pollution associated with this. We'll see increased uh, demand for aluminum as well. Next slide. And then zinc mining. Now there's a couple of really key metals that are, are co-products or byproducts or tertiary products of uh, zinc mining. Indium and cadmium are uh, among the most common of those. And cadmium is largely going into thin film for solar. Indium has multiple uses. It's going into, everybody's looking at it through indium right now. If you're looking on a flat panel display or you're touching a phone, that's got indium tin oxide in it, also used in the solar industry. Next slide. So, and then lastly, we're, we're gonna see increased demand for just things like sand and gravel for a lot of these infrastructures. A lot of cement, a lot of stuff that needs rebar, and we're already seeing in my area of, of um, Santa Cruz, California area, Santa Cruz Mountains, we, we have proposed gravel mines on sacred sites as well. So these are you know, going into the construction industries. So they're not clean tech, but they're foundational for clean. You, you need cement for a lot of these, these facilities and things like that. Next slide. And then also we have issues with the labor in these supply chains as well. Um, you know, not enough attention I think is being given to the issues of um, 
potential forced labor, the allegations of forced labor for 40% of the global polysilicon supply in Xinjiang. Um, we see uh, po groundwater pollution and, and perhaps some um, labor occupational health issues associated with the rare earth processing industries in China as well. Next slide. So mining has you know, other steps down, down the chain. And at the same time, we're, we're seeing increases, increases in amounts of vo volumes of waste from these clean technologies that are being put into landfills um, or hazardous waste facilities and, and not being looped back in, which is kind of the vision for some for closing or accessing more resources for solar. So you can see there, those are piles of solar panels. There's a lot of silver and aluminum in that big pile there, and then glass as well. So by 2050, it's expected that solar alone, not, not including the batteries or inverters, but solar panels will be about 10% of the global e-waste supply. That's a huge resource that we could be using to, to offset or, or avoid some of this potential mining. Next slide. And there are other reasons to do this too. We're seeing increases in fires at, at MRFs. These are material recycling facilities. And, because, and this isn't because of the clean tech necessarily, but because we have ubiquitous batteries everywhere. And these batteries tend to catch fire. And mo most of these fires are being caused by um, you know, a battery getting tossed through a shredder and then have these thermal runaways, which sparks a big fire. These are costing the public millions of dollars when they damage facility. They had a big fire, I think, in Alameda that cost $4 million of damage to a recycling facility. So that's all falling on the public's ledger right now. Next slide. And this is partly because in the United States, we don't have policies that encourage closing that loop. We have what I would characterize as a cradle to grave system. We take resources, we use them, we make stuff, and then we toss them into landfills. And that's partly because we had with electronic products, which most of these clean techs would fall under, we only regulate them if they're hazardous. And a lot of them aren't, they don't meet the criteria for hazardous, to, to be considered hazardous, because they're maybe not hazardous enough. Whereas in the European Union, they characterize all electronic waste as something that needs to be recovered and recycled. So that's closed loop systems. Next slide. We're seeing some states take leadership, by the way, on this. Washington state is leading. So the goal really for this is you know, we, we will continue to need metals from somewhere. And we're going to need renewable energy to put somewhere. And um, many of these depend on fossil fuels and feedstocks to make the plastics and, and things like that. Silicon requires coal for, for coking right now. So thinking about how to incentivize this system where we recover materials from the clean, these clean technologies that before they end up in landfills, it'll be harder to mine a landfill than it would be to collect these materials together today. So um, thank you. I'm sorry if I went over a little bit, but hopefully that was a that was, that was concise overview of the issues. <clears throat> Thank you, Professor Mulvaney. So the last panelist we have before discussion today is Lauren Cagle. So Lauren, go ahead and proceed when you're ready. Um, hello. You know, I want to talk about uh, pollution mining side of this. And Earthworks believes that we need to transition as quickly as possible to a clean energy economy. Um, and we know that um, materials and minerals are going to be at, um, the laws. First of all, we want to make sure we have that sustainable mineral uh, economy that Dustin referred to and that we are looking at that for the first line of defense in terms of electronic, uh, electronic research doing more in when we need uh, Raquel, um, you may think that um, the United States probably has great laws that regulate mining. Um, and the reality is the opposite. Um, we have some of the most outdated mining laws and regulations on the books. Um, the, um, the type of mining 
um, you know, zinc, copper, gold, you're, you know, there's, I see a question in the chat from, um, from Steve around, does the world need any more gold? Um, and the reality is you're often in, in these mines, it's not just one metal that you're mining. Um, and so I think that's an important, um, you know, is it a gold mine? Is it a gold copper mine? Is it a gold copper? Um, is it a zinc mine? Is it a copper molybdenum mine? And so there's, um, you know, the, especially with the rare earths as well, um, you know, being, um, you know, sort of a smaller percentage of a, of a much larger mine um, that may be mining something like gold, but there's uh, additional resources to be found. Um, and so this is referred to as a rock mine. It is, and that's sort of your non-fuel minerals not oil and gas, um, and also not sand. That's a separate law that will, um, I don't have a slide on modernizing that, but we may need to work on it. Um, but so this is the 1872 mining law sort of governs non-fuel minerals um, on public lands. So these are lands um, that were traditionally um, uh, indigenous lands um, and are now sort of in the purview of the American people. Um, and this law has not been meaningfully updated. It was, um, as you um, might expect, it was created to advance the settler, settler colonialism um, of the 1800s and really to govern pick and shovel miners. So not the sort of large scale mining that we've been referencing today. Um, and so as you can imagine, um, this law does a really poor job um, of regulating the type of mi modern mining that we have now. Um, and one of the key pieces and what um, especially communities across the country, but especially indigenous communities uh, struggle with is that um, the mining law has been interpreted to prioritize mining above all other uses of land. So this leaves communities that are impacted by mining um, with very little they can do to stop a mine proposal that may impact their land, water, cultural resources, air. Um, Next slide, please. Um, and so we've, you know, we've, we have these outdated mining laws and regulations, and we've also got the mining industry who sees this clean energy revolution on the horizon and is thinking about how they can be a part of it. Um, and so the, the critical minerals rhetoric, um, you know, while we are hope while we are hopeful that we can create the sustainable minerals economy that we need, um, you know, there may be some mining. Um, there's gonna, even if we weren't transitioning to a clean energy economy, there is still always gonna be mining under these archaic laws. Um, and so the mining industry has really um, sort of ramped up its push for more domestic mining to feed the sort of clean energy technology and electronics. Um, and so the solutions that I'm gonna talk about in my next couple of slides um, are not necessarily about no mining, but it's about better mining laws um, and regulations in addition to that sustainable minerals economy. Um, so there are sort of, without these, without these policy solutions, we're in a really bad situation domestically um, because we are, we need this transition, we need it quickly. Um, but we don't want it to come at the expense of mining impacted communities, um, either here or, or, um, or internationally. Um, I am, but I am focusing uh, mostly on um, the solutions for, for here in the United States. Next slide. And so there are actually some regulatory changes. Um, uh, changing the 1872 mining law is, is a legislative fix. Um, that would require congressional action. There has been um, attempts over the years to update the 1872 mining law. Um, with this particular Congress, um, we were not quite sure that that's going to become a reality. But the good news is, at, is that the Biden-Harris administration can, can take action themselves under some regulations that they have complete control over, no congressional action needed. Um, so we've got the Bureau of Land Management's mining regulations and the Forest Service mining regulations. And so this will allow for, to create more, more tribal consultation, to create more of a community consent um, model 
so that my so that communities who are impacted by mines aren't just sort of left with oh there's nothing you can do to stop this mine just you know just um, move along and so we really want to create um, a situation where communities have more say in what's happening um, nearby and we also want to create I mean we we need to move past um, these old laws and regulations to um, to really update um, you know, how, what does it mean to reclaim a mine? What does it mean to really protect water? What are the best available technologies in place for um, siting and creating tailings dams? There's a lot of sort of technical how to design a mine in a way that can, can protect, better protect air, air, land, and water. Um, and we just simply don't have those regulations on the books right now. Um, so we're left with this sort of state patchwork, which is often really it's just sort of mining companies, you know, sort of saying, trust us to, to create the best mine that we can. Um, and uh, the reality is that's not working um, because we are seeing some, you know, we are seeing impacts to water, air, communities, um, you know, every day um, in terms of hard rock mining. So next slide, please. So that's sort of the public lands chain changes that are needed. Um, which completely um, within the power of the, the Biden-Harris administration. Um, in terms of mining across the country, um, there are some other changes that we think are really important that are within the EPA's purview. Um, so the Clean Water Act, you all might think, well, that's a great law um, that protects, you know, that protects water um, in, in, in this country. And, it does, um, unless you're a mining company, um, because there are two loopholes in the Clean Water Act that allow many hard rock mines to dispose of mine waste directly into rivers, lakes, streams, and wetlands. Um, and so we, um, we know that this administration is going to be updating um, the Clean Water Act, Waters of the US, what, how do we protect water in this country? And we hope that they're gonna include closing these two mining loopholes. Um, as part of that. Um, and we, we want to make sure that we are disposing of mine waste in a way that protects water, not that that turns a stream into a mine waste system. That's, that's not what we want. Um, the other piece is um, around uh, CERCLA, um, which is our sort of super fund law you'll, you'll um, hear it referred to. And this, there's actually a, a, a piece of the super fund law where the EPA has not only the authority, um, but they're actually compelled to require mining companies to provide financial assurances um, to demonstrate that there's, there's they, they have adequate funds to protect water um, and actually clean up and reclaim that mine um, at the end of the process. Um, and also put all the pieces in place Make sure the tailings, you know, make sure the tailings dam, um, you know, is is structured in a way that's not going to impact communities if there's a huge storm. All these things, um, these worst case scenarios, um, really, that's what the Superfund law is for. It's to make sure that we're not creating toxic legacies that the um, that that taxpayers are left to clean up. And. The, the Obama administration actually had, had moved to do some really important work um, under, under CERCLA that the Trump administration um, sort of declined to finalize when, when they came into office. Um, so the, the real message is that this transition to clean energy is, is needed, it's coming, and we can't do it in a just way unless we address the potential mining impacts and update some of these key, key, key regulations and laws. Thank you, Lauren. Um, all right, so we're gonna just move into some discussion. Um, and I just wanna start out with a question for Mike Lopez, and this has a few parts to it, so I'll just start with the, the first part, which is um, to ask you to please describe meaningful consultation with tribes. Meaningful consultation with tribes. So I, I think I'm gonna to have to provide sort of a more comprehensive response to that. Um, it sounds like a simple question. 
Well, first of all, we recognize that every native nation, every federally recognized tribe within within the United States is unique. Um, it's its own sovereign, its own its own background and culture and priorities. And so consultation may be viewed differently by different tribes. So this, this what I'm providing you is a perspective of the Nez Perce tribe, uh, not necessarily uh, other federally recognized tribes, but meaningful consultation uh, include, uh, in our view, it requires accountability uh, and enforcement. And those are two attributes that, um, that really is missing in consultation today. I mean, going back to President Clinton's 2000 Executive Order 13175, very well intentioned, um, put the United States on, and federally recognized, federally recognized tribes on the right path to improve upon intergovernmental dialogue and coordination and um, discussions, but within that executive order um, is section 10, uh, judicial review. And this it, it states, this order is intended only to improve the management of the executive branch and not intended right benefit or trust responsibility, substantive or procedural enforceable at law by a party against the US or any agency. And so, that language has carried forward uh, with consultation um, and it resonates now with a lot of agency practices and it's resulted in, you know, in our view in, um, in consultation that in many ways has collapsed into a box checking sort of perfunctory exercise and uh, and so what we would like to see is more enforceability with consultation. How can that be done? Um, for Congressman Grijalva, a few years ago, had proposed some legislation through the RESPECT Act that would provide for judicial review um, on tribal consultation. That would be one way to improve accountability. Another way is, for, is to require consultation to find a home in agency regulations. Uh, the Biden administration could have its agencies promulgate regulations um, within, within each agent that, that would that would create enforceability and accountability for tribal consultation. Right now, it's just a policy and it's viewed as a policy. And like any policy, it can be shaped and molded, it can be misused and it can be abused or ignored. So we would like to see, we would like to see consistency and enforceability with regulations. And then drilling down a little bit further, um, we would like a, a consultation or meaningful consultation process to include uh, documenting documenting um, negotiations in the administrative record. When we say negotiations, we really view consultation as a negotiation between two governments. Um, and we hope that agencies view it that way. Uh, Dr. Bay, you got to part of my part of my question there, um, but I look like you froze for a sec. Are you oh. you back? You're back. Great. Okay, I was getting a little ahead of my skis there. I think. Uh, <laughs> yeah, no and, worries. As I and just uh, yeah, so so documenting these negotiations in the admin record, trying requiring agencies to try to reach consensus with uh, tribal governments on proposed projects. And to do that, to try to require that more than once because consultation is a process. It's not one meeting, it's not one exchange. It's a it's a it's a conversation over time, and um, and also you know the administration can have cabinet level officers uh, to help oversee consultation, to improve upon enforcement and accountability, and perhaps with improved consultation there could be a dispute resolution. Um, process within consultation that could also um, be used um, if um, a tribal government and a federal agency can't can't reach consensus or agreement on a particular decision. So and in the context of, of, of uh, consultation and treaty rights, I just want I just want to emphasize that that um, in our experience, we we um, we see that we view agencies as treating treaty rights like they must just be considered, and treaty rights are under Article Six, Clause Two of the United States Constitution, are the supreme law of the land, and they are property rights, and those property rights cannot be ignored, they cannot be waived, they cannot be limited. 
um, those are those are rights that tribal governments possess and in fact ceded millions of acres of land in many cases like the Nez Perce and they, they should be respected and should be regarded as, as law. And so all these things together um, in our view point to uh, a real need to improve upon the, the consultation process to make it enforceable, to make it accountable and to make it responsive um, responsive to federal law and to treaty rights. Thanks, Mike. Yeah, and you, you anticipated the next part of my question, which is going to be not only what is meaningful consultation, but what can we ask agencies to, what, what should agencies be doing better? And then I guess I'll just cap that question off with, um, for the folks, since most, most of the audience here today are other environmental groups, um, what can the broader conservation community be doing to help assist in that, if anything? I think um, simply recognizing the potential negative impacts um, that uh, of mining and when talking about renewable energy in this um, needed transition, um, part of that just transition is making sure that that mining communities um, aren't aren't impacted. Um, and I, I think really emphasizing that part of the transition needs to require creating the sustainable minerals economy. Um, and we really can't do it without that. Um, and so just more discussion, um, especially for folks that are really focused on climate and the transition and the, and the quick timeline that we, that the IPC sets out for us, um, you know, sort of acknowledging these issues and uh, especially when, when talking to, um, to key folks within this administration. I have another question here for, um, for Professor Mulvaney. And that question is, President Biden has proposed a multi-trillion dollar infrastructure package. So how do you believe those resources may be best deployed to develop a robust circular economy? And specifically on which part of the supply chain would you direct focus? That's a huge question. I don't know if I can easily answer that. Um, you know, I, I guess I, I would like to see, I would have liked to see um, more emphasis on connecting the incentives to making sure things get cleaned up in the end. I think, you know, and this kind of piggybacks off on, on the, the previous question a little bit, there, there tends to be less focus on waste now. I mean, I've seen it in my own career, like the climate conversation really has drowned out waste, water, wastewater, all of these issues seem to not get the same level of, of attention. And I think to the extent that we could incentivize deployment to, to be thinking about these considerations. I mean, a lot of my specific work focuses on, on land use and, and solar development. And I, I feel like there's not very careful uh, work being done on that. I think, you know, I'm thinking about the, the consultation process. I, I, I've interviewed a bunch of, um, tribes that are not a bunch, a couple of folks representing uh, non-federally recognized tribes. And they felt like the consultation process from the last stimulus package was not very good. They didn't feel like they got much um, voice in, in suggesting what, what, what where, where projects should go and, and where they shouldn't go. So I think it's hard to say specifically about technologies and because it, it, they're so, each project is so space um, in context specific, but you know, tying things like um, better land use practice to incentives for solar or making sure that there's a cleanup plan or that companies are committed to, um, in the electronic waste world, this phrase extended producer responsibility, making sure that there's some money set aside to clean up solar panels or batteries or inverters or or wh whatever it is so um i think that has passed i don't think that we're obviously you can't tie those things to the to the stimulus package but to the extent that as we see projects being proposed you know emphasizing which projects are good and which are better or are, are not so good i think that that we have to do more sifting i think that there's a bit of um of good versus bad or better versus worse and, and I don't see that taking, a, taking 
a, that, care, that conversation is not being very carefully done. It's just get it all out there as fast as possible. And I think that that is very problematic. I think the fast tracking is going to be very hard and very problematic in this because there's going to be an effort and push to expedite projects, which, you know, it, their cultural resource reviews, the, the Endangered Species Act reviews, those are really hard to do when you are in a fast track situation. And, and I haven't published the evidence. I haven't really analyzed it closely, but you know, just looking at you know my own experience and seeing solar projects being built in Nevada and California, the fast track projects are the worst ones. They're the ones that cause the most damage. They're the ones that require the most mitigations. They're the ones that have to get stopped because they found an ancient cremation site or some other cultural resource. So um, that's my concern with the stimulus package right now is, is and, and it's a political challenge too, because you know, if Congress flips, that money goes away. So that's part of the reason that they have to fast track things. So it's a, it's a tight rope to walk, I think. And I don't know if I answered your question specifically enough, but um, I think the challenges are ahead of us. You know, it's nice that there's a pile of money that we're gonna put into clean technology. Now, now comes the hard work of like, where does it go? And that's, I think, where we have to be paying attention and, and not rooting for everything. We have to sift a little bit. We have to figure out good versus bad, who benefits, I think is a big, big question we never ask. You know, if, if all, we're going to spend all this money on transmission and solar and batteries, and it's just going to benefit companies that are also promoting natural gas, by the way, to their shareholders, that's not necessarily the, the benefits. We're not going to get the benefits out of the stimulus that we want to see. Yeah, I think, um, I mean, the the kind of the overarching theme of today is this is a huge, huge problem and a really complicated one that we're not going to have all the answers for at once. And certainly having 10 or 15 minutes to talk it through here is really, it's going to, it's going to spark some conversations, but we've, we're barely scratching the surface. surface. So, um, and I guess on on that note, we we're kind of dwindling on time here. So I'm just going to have one more question here for Lauren, and then we'll just jump to some audience questions. So, uh, Lauren, for you, how has the mining industry forced their scarcity mindset in the U.S., and how can legislators and other decision makers push back against that rhetoric? Yeah. So, um, you know, they've really the the mining industry has has sort of tried to use everything that's happening to their advantage. Um, we need more mining quickly now with less environmental review. Um, you know, let's just get these mines in the ground because we need these metals. Um, and we don't want to get them from, God forbid, we want, don't want to get them from other countries, even though, you know, the, the market for, it's a global economy that we have and that includes, that includes metals. Um, and so they really use it to their advantage, um, especially under the, the Trump administration to try to streamline um, some of these projects. Um, and, and luckily, uh, you know, I think this new administration is hopefully going to, um, you know, slow down and do some of these needed changes. Um, but it's, we need to start, I, I think you know, there was a question in the chat around like, how do we take away from this sort of more consumption, um, you know, world that we're in. And I think part of that is um, it is that focus, refocusing on waste and how we can create um, a world where we don't just throw away everything that we use. Um, and that throwing that away just doesn't have that landfill, um, you know, or wherever that's going, but actually could harm a mining community because a mining company is trying to, um, to mine when they really should just be, we should really just be using the, recycling those metals. Thanks, Lauren. Um, we're going to jump to some audience questions. And I apologize. You guys are great. You have a ton of questions. So I think maybe one way we can do this is, is copy all of these and send some kind of a, a written reply as well if we don't get to all of them. Um, let me see here. Um, there's a question for from Kelly Fuller that it says, will the desire for lithium batteries lead to increased phosphate mining? Is there anyone here who wants to take that or feels like they can take that? I, I took a shot at it. I, I actually don't know. I think it's a great question. I haven't thought much about it. So much of that phosphate goes into fertilizer. I'm not sure it would budget much because there's an effort to get people to use less of that phosphate fertilizer. So it might balance out, but it's a great question. 
and we need sustainable sources of phosphate too. There's a big push for the, the iron phosphate batteries because they don't have the cobalt, the manganese, the aluminum. So that's that was such a big effort and campaign early on. Everybody decided to do their R&D in that direction. So that's a great question. I don't have a good answer. Only speculation. Thanks. Thanks, Justin. Um, there's a question from Taylor Reed. She says, I'm curious in terms of pathways for these mining regulations to be properly reformed, where should the pressure be best applied? Um, direct campaigns to government, spreading awareness of these issues such that consumers of EVs or home batteries, for example, um, demand that manufacturers like Tesla adhere to a higher standard of community and environmental impact. How does the public engage um, since the agencies and mining companies aren't often in the conversation with the public? It's a good question. Yeah, I mean, I think um, our, we'd probably, at our talk, we'd probably say both. I mean, I think the, um, you know, the end users, um, so car companies, battery companies, technology companies, uh, they need to be part of this conversation. They need to be demanding better mining and better sourcing of minerals and materials. Um, and then we need, we, we also need to pressure um, folks at EPA, Department of Interior, um, to this is the time, you know, before we start a potential, you know, boom for new minerals, which, you know, I, I hope we don't, but we, we never know. Um, we need to, to, re to reform these, the, the antiquated laws that we have on the books. So say both. It, and if I could add to that, in, in California, two years ago, there was a big effort to get solar panels, lithium ion batteries under some uh, extended producer responsibility effort. CalRecycle, California Energy Commission, California Public Utilities Commission, uh, Department of Toxic Substances Control, all got together and started to propose something, but then something happened. I even give a talk, I remember at, at the CPUC um, as part of a big day long workshop. And then all that stuff disappeared from the internet. My talk is now, behind, I have to do a public act, a records request to get my talk. So, so, so I think there needs to be more pressure on the companies. I think there's obviously company, there's obviously interest in this, the solar battery recycling, closing the loops on, on circular economy, but there's so much, there must be some lobbying going on or somebody's pushing um, the regulators buttons because California should have led on that. I mean, that there, it's no question, California should have extended risk responsibility. Washington state already proposed the, the policy that closes the loop on, on that. And, you know, we need those metals that we, we could have better places to, to uh, you know, recover materials from, but there's not, there's not much pressure on these companies. Not, not the, not the battery companies and not, not the battery and not the solar companies. And, and, and the, so I think there needs to be more pressure on them. There's no differentiation. All battery companies are good. All solar companies are good. I think we need to start pointing to ones where mistakes are being made or where we might have someone who's not being, um, you know, a very thoughtful actor. The next question we have is from Hillary Bright. She says, she asks, what is the role of the federal government in creating a stable recycling infrastructure that can withstand the volatility in commodities markets? Also a good question. I, I can, oh, good. No, you, I, I'm sure you have the same thought. I, I sit on the technical advisory board for the hazardous waste of Santa Clara County. So I see lots of hazardous waste stuff going around. Um, I, that's a huge point. I think, you know, the reason we don't have th these recycling industries emerging is because you don't, there's not, the value's not there yet. You know, if you look at a solar, I'll, I'll, again, I'm, I know I'm focusing on solar panels more than anything that's what I mainly focus on. Um, you know, 50% of the value of a recovered solar panel is in those aluminum frames and in that silver. There's not very much silver. So that's mainly glass you have to deal with. So you gotta get, you gotta become a good glass recycler um, to, to get some value out of that. In the academic literature, there's a, uh, uh, a, a framework that, or a, I don't know if you call it a framework, an explanation or a hypothesis that in order to get uh, people to act on waste issues, you need Baptists and you need bootleggers. And the bootleggers are the ones who make money on the recycling. And the Baptists are the ones who say, we need to recycle because it's good for the environment. We don't have the Baptists. 
and the bootleggers aren't making any money yet. So we need the Baptists to be promoting the recycling and we need to, we need to get a little more, and, and, and government can assist this actually. At a master's thesis a couple of years ago, we interviewed um, the head of PV Cycle who set up a recycling scheme in Europe because of anticipated regulation um, in 2007. And we asked them about their waste projections. We said, oh, you made all these waste projections in 2007. You said all this stuff was gonna be coming back and you'd make some money on it. How'd they turn out? And it turns out just the very act of collecting the solar panels has created a secondary market for them. So you get a reuse market from solar panels because you're starting to pile them all together. The issue with waste is we dissipate it everywhere. And think about solar panels, rooftop solar panels, right? I think they're all over the neighborhoods and they're coming off at different times and things like that. So you have to come up with some model. And that's why that's, I think the role of regulation there is to require a take back and recovery system hopefully prepaid by the producer. Sometimes that falls on the state budget, but just the act of piling those solar panels together makes it more valuable to the bootlegger. So Baptists and bootleggers. Um, I'll go ahead and move to the next question. I, we're running close to the top of the hour here. So maybe one or two more. And so I apologize if I don't get to all of them. Um, you certainly won't. And I also apologize for the mispronunciation I'm about to commit. <laughs> um, but this is a question from Pajmaha Ear. Um, what percentage of mined materials for US products come from the US? If other countries have lenient mining laws and the US closes CWA's Clean Water Act loopholes and increases mining regulations, what would keep mining companies from mining outside of the US and bringing back the materials for US companies? Um, I don't have those numbers off the top of my head, but I do want to, you know, um, we don't want to do, that's not what we want. We don't want to say, okay, we're not going to mine here. So we're going to mine, we're just going to outsource this environmental injustice somewhere else. Um, and so that is um, why Earthworks is a part of the initiative for responsible mining assurance, um, which is, you know, a way that mining companies um, can actually mine better even when there aren't great environmental laws on the books. Um, and so we are really encouraging, um, you know, this is a multi-stakeholder process, took about a decade to create some of the best mining um, practices out there. Um, and there is a way that companies who are using these, um, who need these metals can source from only IRMA certified mines. So they know that whether or not they are, um, you know, wh wherever that mine is, is that that company is following the best practices around labor, human rights, water protection, sacred sites, etc. cetera. Um, and so that is, at least one small solution moving forward to make sure that we're not just outsourcing this pollution elsewhere. All right, well. Um, and hi, PJ. We, That's one of, one of my <laughs> students in my lab okay. who also teaches in our department. So you knew how bad my, my mispronunciation was just then too. <laughs> um, um, we, I think we're right at two o'clock, so I'm sorry. I think we were out of time to keep answering questions here, but um, Lauren is it, and panelists, is it reasonable to just try to address some of these in writing um, and maybe uh, and send them to folks who registered for this? Yes. Great. Um, well, thank you all. It must have been recording. Oh, so for your friends and colleagues that didn't get a chance to um, be here today, um, we're happy to um, send out the recording of this. Great. Thank you all for, for tuning in today. Um, and, and like I said, this is just scratching the surface. So look forward to more conversations. And um, I hope you all enjoy the rest of your Thursday. Great. Nice to meet you. you all. I look forward to staying in touch. Thank Bye. you. All right. Goodbye.